Hello everyone, my name is Alexander Campos and I'm very pleased to be joining Donald and I here today for the discussion. Uh, just to give you some information about the panel today, or actually the artist's rough talk discussion presentation, it's a mixture of soil and art and community projects. And we'll tell you all about the details of the project, but just to give you some information about the speakers. Uh, Dr. Anya Patseva uh, is a native Russian, and holds a PhD in Earth and Environmental Science from Cooney Graduate Center. In addition to her academic exploration, she's a research and program coordinator at New York City's Urban Soils Initiative. Her experience is assessment of bio, bio, bioavailability of heavy metals in urban soils. Anya has presented her research in national and international soil conferences in Italy, Mexico, Brazil, China, Russia, and authored and co-authored 17 manuscripts and book chapters. With more than, and with more on the way. Uh, and she also teaches as a speaker and lecturer at Brooklyn College and New York University. Uh, joining her is Donald Edeles, who is an artist living working in the largest city in America. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was born and raised. This is this is Donald, as you'll get to know him. Yeah. He was born and raised in the sites, the shadows of the nation's largest public observatory. Educated at the University of Washington and San Francisco Art Institute. Drew to film, photography, sculpture, and installation. Donald works draws attention to idiosyncratic and uh, nuanced contradictions and assume truth. Since 2006, the Zulumi River Project, which we'll be discussing today, has all of the national concern for invasive species into a more complex debate of biodiversity and existential issues of anthropocentric effort. Um, his work has been shown around the city and around the country as well, including uh, the Spack Mountain here in the city, uh, in London, White Hill, and so forth. So, here we're here to them, so I'm going to stop here and ask them to uh, talk about the projects. I think Anya's going, Anya's going first, and there's a brochure upstairs. There's a next small exhibition upstairs that you're more than welcome to see if you haven't seen it already afterwards. But and I have to say, the uh, presentation is being uh, filmed, so let everyone know. And if you're going to ask questions uh, after the presentation, we ask you to use the mic up front because uh, Donald is recording it. I'm very, very happy to have you and to share my research, uh, my research with you. I'm a soil scientist and I study urban uh, soil contamination. And uh, next, so you can see. Uh, in, uh, around the United States and Canada, there are about 18,000 community gardens. And uh, just in New York, there are about 1,500. Uh, highlighting the importance of urban gardening and engagement with soils, uh, it, the community gardens and home gardens bring uh, lots of benefits to people, of course. It's nutritious food, it's community building, uh, it even reduces crime activities because people have something to do. Uh, but it is associated with the uh, next place associated with some um, hazards. What are the hazards? You probably heard um, it's a lead and the commonly arsenic that are found in urban soils. And uh, the problem is them uh, been for even thousands of years, but people still using and still put them into the soils. Lead was discovered like 5,000 years ago. Ancient Romans would put lead into their wine to make it sweeter. Uh, we put it on gasoline and then we, you know, breeze it in, we put it on the soil, we eat vegetables growing in those soils. Arsenic came uh, at a later time, but commonly was used as pesticides. Next, please. And uh, the main sources of arsenic are the pesticides, lead arsenate, that uh, was used against gypsy moss and was sprayed in northeast of, uh, coast of the United States uh, in orchards. But it doesn't go anywhere, it stays in the soil. And lead, it's commonly from uh, paint, uh, paint chips from the old houses, um, soils, uh, point source emitters, and some gasoline. Why are we concerned about those metals? Well, lead is neurotoxin. It uh, defects cognitive development, especially of children. Uh, they acute drops with the increase of blood lead level. And arsenic is carcinogen. Um, it can cause some cancer. Uh, it's, that's why it's important to study those metals and see how they uh, can be uh, uptaken by plants or by humans. 
Here you can see the current status of lead in the New York City garden soils, and the majority or the highest concentrations of Oh, it's not working, but the highest concentrations of uh, uh, lead are found in uh, Greenpoint, Williamsburg, downtown Brooklyn, Prospect Park. Uh, those areas, uh, you can see the in the in red on the slide, and it's very, I started hearing the noise, someone lives there? Yeah. So you should test your soil, and we can talk where you test it, it's right behind this wall. Uh, we have the soil lab at part of New York City Urban Earth Institute. You're welcome to bring your soil here or send it here and we'll test for you. Uh, it's really important um, to know and you don't want to grow vegetables, especially if you have kids, for kids to play in that soil. Um, other uh, areas are more uh, safer, as you can see, like in yellow, uh, and the typically concentration drops from the inner city toward the suburbs, because in the inner city it's where most of the uh, historical contamination was from industrial sites. Next, please. And here, oh, another one. On this map, you can actually see a subset of 126 uh, gardens that I chose and overlapped with some historical sites in the blue and some um, uh, current uh, sources of contamination in, uh, in yellow. Uh, those are buffers, and some of them, like in brown, they were uh, overlap. Uh, so a lot of gardens are contaminated from uh, past industrial um, use, like legacy lead, uh, manufacturer smelters, coal yards um, that existed between 1764 and 2004. Those considered historical contaminants. Some of the manufacturers uh, may potentially release now contaminants as well, uh, or some uh, waste transfer stations the, or major roads that are current sources. Next, please. Oh, but it's uh, important to know is that it's not the, the total concentration that is uh, uh, harmful. It's bioavailable. What does it mean? Those maps were constructed using total concentrations, and it's what mostly uh, you're going to test when you send your soils to the lab. Uh, it's important to know how much can be uptaken by humans, and not all lead is bioavailable, meaning it's not all harmful, but only fraction. And to know that fraction is actually very difficult, and it's what scientists have been working for decades, and it's what my PhD was um, about. So bioavailable is how much lead can get, in, or any other contaminants, get into human and affect tissues and organs. But um, uh, it's time consuming to do those analyses because they're tested on animals, and it's unethical, and very expensive and uh, long. So scientists tried to find other ways how to measure it in the, in the lab conditions. And that uh, con fraction would be called bioaccessible. The idea is the same, but just different measurement techniques. Next, please. And uh, I did this by accessibility studies about 50 samples in New York City to look at the um, uh, variability. And um, what is interesting, that we don't see the correlation between uh, total uh, lead you can see on the graph and by accessible lead there is no correlation between the two and we measure the two different pH ranges that is the uh, protocols that are used by uh, EPA uh, 1.5 is the pH of our gastric solution and 2.5 is our proposed uh, method to measure it um, so in both cases we don't see any correlations highlighting the importance of measuring bioaccessible lead or bioavailable but it's not uh, available for uh, public testing, uh, uh, to actually know how much is harmful. Uh, but we're able to use some equations to convert bioaccessible into bioavailable, and I came up with this um, uh, table. The, out of this uh, 49 samples, 70% were at actually at low risk, which is a good thing. Uh, couple samples were like medium risk and 27% were at um, uh, high risk. So most of the samples were still uh, at low risk, which is good. Even at the high concentration, as you can see in the graph, at the high total concentration, we may get very low by accessibility, uh, which means we need to measure by accessibility rather than total concentrations. Here's a case study from uh, suburban New Jersey. We did some studies in a suburban farm in New Jersey, and they have a contamination with uh, lead and arsenic from a lead arsenic pesticide used about 100 years ago. It doesn't go anywhere, it stays in the soil. So they invited Brooklyn College to do some analysis. We amended the soils with different treatments. We used um, 
uh, bone meal, triple superphosphoid, manure compost, and raised bed compost to mitigate that soil and arsenic. Why those uh, lead and arsenic? Why those met, uh, amendments? Uh, bone meal and triple superphosphate contain phosphorus, and uh, when phosphorus combined with lead, it forms paramorphic mineral, which is very stable and uh, uh, not bioavailable. It's what we want to have. And compost uh, uh, have the same target. Uh, they form uh, organic, organic mineral complexes that are also uh, unavailable for humans. And uh, they are, uh, even if they, you ingest this type of soil, it's not going to harm your organs. It just goes through the system. And it also dilutes the uh, soils um, and brings the total concentration down. So what we found here that uh, some uh, vegetables, like carrots, would take more lead, and radishes would take more arsenic. Tomatoes were the safest uh, vegetables to produce even in contaminated soil. And uh, lettuce, uh, lettuce would be contaminated through the splashes and dust from surrounding areas. Um, uh, so it's uh, really important to, uh, to peel your produce, to wash your produce, uh, but for carrots, it will not help because the carrots can submit it through inside. You also core inside of the uh, carrot. That's the mechanism, it's through. Uh, it uptake, but it will help for other vegetables. So choose fruits over roots when you can plant in contaminated soil. You can still uh, uh, ca plant in contaminated soil, but just need to be careful what is the level and what you can plant. And uh, there are some guidelines at which level you can still plant different vegetables, so lead and arsenic. Um, there's also paper on the table from uh, this study. Uh, you, can, you can read in more detail and some recommendations that I provide. Um, so uh, where we uh, contamination coming from, it's uh, some of it can be uptaken through the soil by roots. Some of them, it's just uh, splashes and dust uh, from surrounding areas. But the taller the plant, the safer typically that is. It has very strong physiological barriers inside, and it's further from the uh, soil. Uh, we found uh, among these amendments that compost was the most uh, useful and plant type is more important than amendment type. Different plants react differently on amendments. So it's a little bit tricky with amendments in urban areas because the soils are very heterogeneous. They're very variable here. Uh, next, please. Uh, another site in, in Brooklyn, we um, wanted to see what is actually the main uh, impact of, uh, on humans. Is it uh, plant uptake, uh, like vegetable contamina contam contamination, or it's a soil dust ingestion, or it's um, uh, dust inhalation? We found it's actually through soil ingestion. And it's mostly harmful for kids. We use the like, little kids, less than six years old. They're typically most susceptible. Uh, organisms, and we found that um, um, next, uh, you can uh, see the guideline, FDA guideline is uh, three microgram per day of lead, uh, but uh, through soil ingestion, uh, it can get up to 17 or 26. We also had different amendments there. Um, so it's, uh, the, it's the main path, um, and only after that it's followed by vegetables and uh, uh, dust. So it's a really, uh, you want to have 80 to 90 uh, milligram per kilogram of lead in the soil to be safe. Although current EPA standard is 400. But to make sure the kids are safe, uh, less than 100 should be uh, adapted. So what is the best mitigation strategy? Uh, currently, we think it's uh, using, um, uh, bringing new soil, like a clean soil on top, uh, building a raised bed on top of the contaminated soil, um, and mixing it with the compost. Uh, some of you may be heard, and you can Google and look for a Clean Soil Bank. It's a program that's been developed by uh, Mayor's Office of Environmental Radiation, they propose to use glacier sediment that is clean um, and ex excavated from uh, New York City uh, before like building construction. So that uh, sediment can be mixed with the compost and uh, use it. Uh, or you can try and find a way how to remediate with amendments, but it can be a little bit tricky. You need some research to be done to be effective. Next. Um, and on this note, I would like to thank you. And uh, you can ask me questions after Donald's presentation. Uh, thanks, Mary and Margaret, for inviting me to come out here and coordinating. This is a really fun installation because it's, it's a bit between 
uh, camping because of the ferry schedule and electricity and mm -hmm. Wi-Fi and there's no toilets. Um, and then also water. like, or running, water, right? or running water, yeah. But there's a lot of passion and somehow it all got done, even the projector. So thanks so much for having me out here. So, um, and Anya, thank you for you know, all your hard work and collaboration, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna talk about this project that I sort of, I started in 2006, but I didn't really know that I was starting it at that time. And it was, it's, it, it's all, it's an umbrella project that includes a series of, of uh, artworks uh, that I've made, um, but in retrospect, I've divided it into these three stages. Um, acquisition, conversion, and distribution. There's a fourth stage that's not, that's not quite um, there yet, but um, these three stages are there. So, could you go to the next slide? So, how I imagined this project was utilizing art as a platform for funding, uh, advertising, and, uh, and basically combining things that I was researching and visualizing that, and then implementing that for this problem of invasive carp, which is like this long, strange passion I've had since 2006, uh, and using the carp as a, um, as like a fertilizer or resource initially. Um, so that's kind of stage one, two, and three. This is an improvisational chart, but we can go to the next. And we'll dive into some of this in detail. Um, so acquisition. So yeah, in 2016 uh, or 2006, I, somehow I ran across this. I think it was on YouTube, but it doesn't even sound right because were people watching YouTube in 2006? Yeah, I mean, I might have seen it on television at that. I, I might have had a television at that time, but I saw this this video. Uh, if you can go to this video, it, it stuck in my mind. It's not this exact video. I couldn't find the actual one, but if you go to the next slide, if you would play this, easiest fishing ever. Huh? So, the, the video that I saw was basically this. Yeah, no, they're slimy too. And, uh, yeah, it was, I've never seen anything like that. Um, and since I've, since I've seen it in real life, I've never seen anything like this before. It's almost biblical, actually. It's, you know, like something falling from the sky or just exploding out of the water. If you can go to the next slide. So um, around 2013 and 14, I began thinking about how I could actually go and catch uh, this fish. And I've been following the evolution of this problem. In 2006 is when it kind of got it to a national level in the form of, the, uh, of an event called the Redneck Fishing Festival or tournament. And it's in Illinois, um, in, in, the Bath, in Bath, Illinois. And, and basically some, a very, small town started this tournament to go and catch these fish as, as an effort to actually deal with the invasive population. And uh, I'd always wanted to go, but I'd always been so broke that I couldn't actually get the resources to go to the middle of the United States. Uh, but I began thinking about if I could go, what, would the, what kind of thing would I need in order to catch these fish? So I designed this, um, these apparatus that you can connect to as sort of a conventional boat. Uh, this is the first prototype of acquisition. If you go to the next slide, there's some more detailed shots. Uh, but basically, it has some arms with like nails to catch the jumping fish. And one thing I should mention as I see your facial expressions turning <laughs> a little bit, um, with invasive species, at least this one, and don't quote me for every invasive species, there's no limit to like how many you can catch and even the conventions of how you catch them. So I know to like people in the greater metropolitan area, this boat might look a little bit medieval, um, but it's actually remarkably similar to what the US Department of Fish and Wildlife used to catch the boat, uh, the fish, which were boats that had electrical fences above the water so when the fish jump out, it would basically electrocute them to death, and then their bodies would just float downstream probably to St. Louis or somewhere there. Uh, so, yeah, there's a facial expression. <laughs> like if you, Yeah, that's taxpayer money. Um, and then this boat basically had this 
aluminum wire net at the front that was supposed to catch the fish that were jumping in. So this is like thinking like the characteristics of this fish, how could I uh, address the fact that it jumps from the water? It's about uh, six to 10 pounds and about 24 inches um, in length. Um, and it's known for uh, hurting recreational boaters. Maybe I should backtrack one second about this invasive species. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you're, it, one of the people in this town that organized the event described it as the equivalent to being hit in the face with a bowling ball. And he had, he'd been working as an emergency room individual, I don't know, in this small town. They had kind of any role that you can fill, you can take it. Um, and uh, yeah, so people will be driving down the, the water and essentially the motor boat scares this fish and it jumps out of the water and, you know, it, it hits people's face. And so, you know, for people who don't live on the, the water or the river, they're kind of like, uh, who can, just don't, don't drive your boat very fast, right? That's the solution. Um, but the history of the fish is something like they were introduced for wastewater treatment plants as a method to control the level of phytoplankton. And um, basically the, the treatment plants flooded and the fish, which were primarily like in the southern United States, have now spread to almost all but 14 states in the United States. And they're nearing to the Great Lakes. And essentially, they're the most uh, successful aquatic organism in North America. And, <laughs> and native species where, that either represent you know, biodiversity or something that people want to fish or eat. Uh, their populations have been declining. So the, the kind of the, the danger point is when these fish get into the, uh, the Great Lakes, they're going to decimate uh, obviously all of that fishing industry and jobs and nutrition that comes out of that, but also then they're going to have access to Canada. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Canadian government have been spending billions constructing various ways to stop them, which are like dams or you know, locks or, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> all kinds, there's literally like there's a new method of trying to take care of this fish every, every year that comes out. And it's interesting because people in New York are like, oh, we don't even have a problem with this. But actually they are in New York State, but they're just not in New York City yet. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. I'll try to speed this up a little bit. So there was no practicality of actually taking this boat from New York to Bath, Illinois, so I tried to take some of its components and shrink it into something that's wearable. So this was, this is my kind of like Power Ranger suit for uh, competing. And we could go to the next slide. The tournament is set up in heats. Each heat is two hours. There's two heats per day. There's four heats. There's, four, there's two days. Uh, they take out about 10,000 fish in four days. But even with that, it's only happening once a year and the population's still growing. In my boat, we caught 52 fish and we, we lost. The, the number one boat caught 272 fish in two hours and they basically had a volleyball net in the middle of their boat, and the fish just jump into it. And you can see, this is about a ton of dead fish. You can hit play on this. Um, and they're ultimately loaded into this refrigerator truck and driven about 100 meters from Thompson uh, Federal Penitentiary, which was where Obama wanted to move all of the prisoners from Guantanamo Bay. And so there's all those it's kind of federal issues going on in the middle of Illinois, and then they're turned into a fertilizer. But the fish have a, capa a strange capacity when they jump out of the water. Their gills, because they're optimized for uh, breathing in low water, they over expand with oxygen and they explode with blood. So every fish, when it jumps out of the water, is just covered in muddy, toxic water and, uh, and fish blood. Um, it's a crazy event if you ever want to go to, 
to Bath, Illinois. It got it got a lot of um, exposure on like BBC and uh, I think I think ESPN went there when I was there. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman making a documentary from um, a National Geographic. So we can go to the next slide. So the the idea of actually like using um, these fish as uh, here's another characteristic of this fish. I can't believe I left this out. The reason that there are two reasons why people don't want to eat this fish. One is that um, the American palate doesn't really eat very much carp. We don't really want much carp, and um, the fish is about 70% fish bone, which means that it's not commercially viable to hire people to fish and pay them by the pound for the fish, especially for meat that nobody wants. Um, so the characteristic that it's 70% bone was beneficial to me because I had learned that there's um, a compound called apatite in, inside the fish bone that bonds with lead and it forms pyrophosphate, as, as Anya was saying, which makes lead in the soil no longer bioavailable. And so the idea was that I catch this invasive species, process it, and then use its fish bone to lower heavy metal pollution in various places, mostly around post-industrial areas in the US. Uh, but just participating in the redneck fishing tournament wouldn't be enough because it's only 10,000 fish and I wanted to actually have this functioning somewhat like a, like a business. And uh, I began researching how other people catch fish rather than sending them out on a boat. And this is like a traditional Chinese dip net. Basically, it's along the shore and you have a cantilever and you, you weight it and you push into the water and you put some kind of a bait, the fish go and you pull up and take the fish out. And since it's an invasive species, you could then catch the fish in ways that are not legal for commercial fishing. But you could commercialize it. So we go to the next slide. I traveled to Vietnam to learn how to make this. Uh, this structure is, it's Chinese dip net, but it's also used in most of Southeast Asia, called the Vo Bay here. And this is uh, in Cu Chi, Vietnam. Um, and we, we built it. It's really rudimentary, but it's kind of brilliant. It's so simple, really inexpensive, um, mostly bamboo. The net's the most expensive part. We can go to the next. So that's the third prototype. So after I caught these fish, it was like the question, like, Okay, you've got these. I, I decided to bring, I would bring five back to New York to test how to process them if I was making like a mock version of this, this uh, workflow or business model. Um, so I vacuum sealed them and I put them in my luggage and <laughs> brought them. These, they were, it, was, it was my freezer for a few years, these big fish, but this is the next step in how to do this. So I realized that you can't, you can't allow dead fish to just decompose at its normal rate because it stinks too much and it's not practical for doing it for any kind of decomposition. So I began looking at ways to rapidly de decompose organic matter and I learned about this black soldier fly. Um, so this is the first prototype of trying to uh, create, a, uh, basically uh, cultivate this, this fly. Um, you can go to the next slide, and you can hit play. So if you guys are composting, you've probably seen this before. These larvae, they're totally innocuous. Um, they have a pretty short lifespan, non-vector fly. They live about six weeks. You can go to the next. And this is what they look like right before they go into pupate. Hit play. They're really kind of amazing. They're, they're like the most curious little insect. Um, okay, so that was like the stage to try to just understand like basic situations and what I learned in that situation is like you, you have to kind of mimic springtime cycles and you have to have, you know, daylight and a certain amount of temperature, certain humidity, temperature, things like that. And this is the second creation of that where I've added uh, an aquarium to create a hydroponic system to grow these plants which are necessary for the adults to mate on before they lay their eggs, which I then used uh, to decompose the fish. And the larva, 
basically can eat uh, incredibly f incredible amounts, <laughs> as you'll see, in a very short amount of time. We could go to the next slide. This is an attempt to, uh, you could see them moving over a time lapse. I was trying to mimic the next video. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is a Swiss group that's also looking at the use of black soldier flies. This is in a 12 hour period and there's two, um, I think they're four pound trout that are completely devoured. There's some uh, caveats to this. La the larvae really only eat during a certain uh, period in their development and then they go into pupate and they basically don't eat at all. But you can see this clock running you can see you can see this video on YouTube also. It's it's kind of inspiring if you're dealing with organic waste. There are also black soldier flies are used in agriculture, um, agricultural waste management. They're also grown for uh, feeding to turtles and chickens as a f form of protein. And that's it. It's like. 11 hours and you're just down to fishbone. So that was the that was the goal, like how can I create uh, a situation like this? And subsequently actually found all of the details um, of how to create this exact situation. But basically you need the larva during about six, who are about six days to 12 days old and they'll eat this, this quickly. Okay, can you go to the next slide actually? So I decomposed the fish bones to, this is, two of the fish, and then I dried them out, and you could go to the next slide. Put them in the oven, next slide. And this is the, and then ground them up, and you, you've got your, this is the commercial fish bone, I guess. It's, it's, there is a company that makes um, fish bone meal, but I don't think anybody uses from invasive fish yet. So you can go, each fish is about one cup of fish bone, and then I had the idea, okay, well, I should go out and put this in some soil and see what it's like. And then I realized that, you go to the next slide, that um, there's not a lot of dirt in New York City, like a place to just access dirt or even test dirt. I mean, you, there's gardens and things like that, but pretty much so much of the surface is covered. So I, um, I used a map from a, an, a project called Ghost Factories by USA Today, and they're basically mapping all of the closed factories that had some kind of a metal smelting uh, activity, and um, most, you can check it out online, it's pretty amazing. I, I think all of your research will probably point to the same thing of like North Brooklyn, Williamsburg. Uh, but I had found this area in the South Bronx, I live in the Bronx, where there was a factory that was smelting lead and I, there was like a patch of open land next to it. So I took a soil sample there, and then on the other side, there was a small park. And I thought, oh, let's just do this as like a control. Um, and then I did it in another park where I live. If we go to the next slide. So these are the, the three samples which I sent to Anya's lab, and she tested them. And if you go to the next la slide. So this is the park that's adjacent, and then the factory is over here. And next slide. What I found was kind of surprising. Actually, the playground had higher amounts of lead than where the factory had been. Now, I, I don't know like what has actually transpired since that factory went out of business. But if you look, there's, um, there's an industrial index in the science engineering uh, business library, science, Inform SIBL on Fifth Avenue. And they'll list all of the, the companies of an industry. And you can see their address and when they open and when they closed. I think this one closed in the 50s. But what I did in this picture, um, aside from overlaying it with some of, you know, just uh, analysis, not necessarily bioavailability. But in the background, you can see there's a public housing projects. And then I collaged in about 14 images that are time-lapsed over this and put in the cars in the background, which don't look unusual, but there is something questionable about having like a playground adjacent to, you know, like the Triborough Bridge, basically going onto the Triborough Bridge. 
Um, and there's nothing unusual about this photo. I mean, you're just looking and you're like, oh yeah, it's like a park, a playground. Um, but my hypothesis about how this lead got there was from uh, leaded tetraethyl lead gasoline and particulate accumulation that was phased out in 1996 from the Clean Air Act. If you go to the next uh, site. So I went to that park and I integrated these fish bones. I basically had two different fish, uh, how I'd slightly dried it differently and tried plotting out like a control, whatever, putting little stakes in. But after I did it, the next week, somebody had removed all my stakes and it snowed. <laughs> so, I, you know, I don't need to test the actual conclusions of it. But essentially, a small part of that land has some dead fish in it. And then, uh, and then the third, which is, or the second way of, uh, of doing this, dealing with this fish, I mean, it was really just became like, how do I even find a place to put fish bone without you know, having any authority to do that, like no jurisdiction, no permits or anything like that. So um, I don't think you can see it in this one, but I could just describe it. Basically, I found this like f median in the middle of a road and there was a little garden. I went and buried another fish there. So that's it. Thanks for your time. Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, I didn't go into detail, but yes, we are actually making a solution, separate solution. It's, there's an EPA protocol that is using glycine. Glycine is known to mimic our gastric system the best as it can be. Um, and the idea is to use the solution outside of actually the stomach and using different acids. So we use a glycine and we add uh, HCl hydrochloric acid to make it acidic between uh, our gastric system is typically between pH 1 and 4. So at 1.5 is the typical pH that EPA measures it. So it's like the most conservative, the, as much as it can be digested or uptaken at this level. So we had to recreate this in the, in the tubes, basically, making the solution outside uh, of, the, uh, of the human body. And then we would uh, mix it up with the soil, extract it for like one hour in a particular tem temperature, and then we would analyze it in the mass spectrometers. Okay. Yeah. And then for tomatoes, um, are they only good for growing in lead contaminated soil, or any kind of, are they like resistant to uptake of any kind of contaminated soil? For the most, I test it for lead and arsenic, but it will be good for most of the metals uh, because the, not just the metals, but any fruit vegetables that are, um, uh, well, fruit vegetables that are tall, they have physiological barriers inside of them. So the first physiological barrier is between the roots and stem, and the second one between like stems and, uh, and leaves or a fruit. So the plant itself doesn't want contaminants to go there. So uh, it does not have much of uptake. But of course, sometimes like it's a crazy amount of contaminant, it may go through the barriers as well. But uh, it's typically like, I don't know, you have to grow it in like in the mining area somewhere. In the urban environment, it should be safe. I grow some vegetable tomatoes even at uh, like 2,000 parts per meter. It's like five times more than EPA. And tomatoes are still fine. Uh, so it's really important to grow something uh, tall for these physiological barriers or uh, because uh, it might get splashes from surrounding areas like lettuce or herbs. Uh, so growing tomatoes or like eggplants, even cabbages because you only eat inside part or any like squash that is growing up, uh, you'll be okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have some more questions, but you know, we have questions that I'm going to help you to ask some questions as well. And because we have a limited time as well, I think it's already two o'clock and there's the next switch going on. So before we ask, I want to ask, can you talk more about the collaboration between the two? Really to share that. And of course that's a very the parallel, you know, issues in a certain way and the carbon and the soil relationship. I also want to talk about the uh, some of the community engagement projects we've done Donald, to really bring the 
potential to issue the car and soil. So yeah, I I, um, I can say how we started collaborating. Uh, I had wanted to take my research to the next level, so I took some classwork uh, at the botanical garden, and coincidentally, I mean this was specifically for this project to learn about soil chemistry, and there were two classes, and I had to sign up for one of them, and then I was like should I pick this person or this person? And I pick Anya. And, and the first day she told me about the research, I said, this is perfect. So that's, yeah, that's how it started. Yeah, it was like about four years ago. And since then, we just start to, you know, talk. And, uh, because someone needs to make those amendments for me to work with them, right? And it's like, it's a great uh, way to create those amendments because you're not just use some kind of fish, but you actually use invasive species and like improve the ecology of the river. So I think it's a, it's a great way, and if it can commercialize it at some point, it will be nice. And in some areas, like in California, when they had a lot of fishery, they use a lot of fish bones, and uh, it doesn't always smell great uh, mm -hmm. when uh, they amended the soil, but it, um, it does work. There's some successful stories. I, haven't used specifically fish bone in my experiments. We used uh, commercial fertilizers that would any gardener would do. Like I just tried to mimic what any person would buy. We went just Home Depot and bought whatever was on the shelf. And so, so. Did you want to talk more about the, how you tried to use it more from the artistic side, bringing more attention to it? Are you, are you talking about uh, like as a platform to for invasive species? Or well, just in how you're trying to kind of commercial, I'm mean, like, mm. great jobs are like the, oh, yeah. the emphasis of using it as an economic resource and yeah. well taking care of the uh, carbon. Yeah, so the fourth stage uh, was to use fishing as kind of, it's not really shared economy, but like, uh, like a, almost a gig economy. Like anybody who wanted to could fish this boat, or could, could fish this fish. Um, and particularly trying to coordinate with people who are recently like out out of prison and potentially you know black boxed, um, but that uh, stage hasn't been implemented yet. So I didn't really want to talk about it a whole lot. But that was the the idea was that this is such an abundant problem, um, but also it's a problem that can be addressed with people who don't necessarily have to have like a very sophisticated skill set or even have to have certain hours that they want to work or even work a specific duration. If you just wanted to go out and f like catch invasive carp, you can just do it like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and then do something else the rest of the week or certain days of the week. Um, and also you wouldn't have to have like a fishing license and something like that. So that was like, that's the fourth stage that's supposed to have this whole workflow going, and if you want to support it, there's a donation box upstairs in the room. <laughs> you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's tape on there. This tape, yeah. So. Some people look at invasive species, not just animals, but plants from the point of view that there is no such a thing as an invasive species, but an environment that is out of balance, and I like that idea. Um, so, taking it from there, my question is, in places where uh, this type of fish is more native, um, what does that environment look like so carbs don't take over? Uh, because yeah. I think that's, you know, I like that approach, so yeah, sure. I like to hear what that's Yeah, so uh, coincidentally I was, um, I was in Austria, Central Europe, in November and December, and they are native there, and I had the opportunity to speak with a New Jersey uh, marine biologist who had been stranded or living in, in Central Europe for several decades. And um, some things that he talked about with that fish, first of all, they have like, you know, traditional uh, carp 
for Christmas. They, you, I guess you could, like in Prague, you can find these carp uh, where they're alive. And there's, I guess, some traditions where people keep them in their bathtub until the day of Christmas, and then they kill it. Are you, have you heard of this? Yeah. Okay. We don't use the Russian uh -huh. um, In terms of, yeah, I did ask him about some characteristics of why the carp population wasn't exploding in the same way it was here. And I think it had something to do with water temperature. Um, so, you know, like in Austria, you know, there's tons and tons of rivers. So uh, if you have an aquatic pest, it can potentially be anywhere, right? Um, and uh, I think that, that, particularly in the southern United States, that carp are able to uh, live and breed nonstop year round, um, and then uh, they don't have natural predators in the same way that they do in their native, actually their native, you know, different carp. There's four invasive carp species in the US, um, but some of those are from Asia, uh, China, and some of them, I think they're collectively called Asian carp, uh, but some of those same species are found in Europe. Um, how the, I think, yeah, there's some kind of social things that have evolved with carp when they're native uh, or non-invasive, um, such as people eat them, either traditionally or daily. Um, and then there's also predation that doesn't really occur here. So I think there's a really, you, I think you've got a really good point though about how to, how we have conceptualized a life form as a problem. Um, and I think it's to, I guess, if I were to defend the implied uh, scientific perspective, it's that invasive species problematize our potential to predict things um, by disrupting what, what's perceived as a stabilized environment in the same way that you can say that some kind of climactic change is a problem because it problematizes our capacity to predict the future whether that's growing, you know, food or, or something like that. Uh, did I answer something of your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and that makes sense. But then again, if you look at it from a historical, historical point of view, environments evolve. Like our environment is not the same now as two thousand years ago. Sure. So I guess it doesn't. For me, it doesn't make sense to want to keep everything as it is right now or as we like it. So things evolve. Sure. Under yeah, and I think that I think that there, that's a really good point. You know, there's the like the um, original. I think what you're describing is like the originalist versus non-originalist perspective on ecology, and it's maybe most easy to compare invasive with non-invasive or native, but you could also think about it as the con how I've seen this issue evolve was originally from invasive to non-invasive. And I personally looked at it and I think, oh, that's strange. Like the vernacular is very similar to how we talk about people who are native or non-native, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think this problem has also evolved, it, how it's conceptualized by the public, um, particularly in light of like the United Nations report that came out two weeks ago that talked about the what was it like a million species that are now on the ex extinction list? So when if if you think about native not in comparison or non invasive not in comparison with native, but on a continuum of uh, native, invasive, native are sort of like average at surviving in an environment. Non-native are problematic because they're too good at surviving in an environment. Extinct are problematic because they're not good at, at surviving in, in an environment. So if you want to address it within that trifecta, it's like, do we want to preserve native? Do we want to preserve those that are about to ex become extinct? Do we want to discourage or dissuade non-native? Or do we, we could also just say like, hey, we can think about like, we've got all these fish that will reproduce. Let's just everybody start eating carp. Right, which is, an, that's totally another way. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I had a comment in regards to this. Um, I think we can all agree that this is an environment that's out of whack. 
right? And it's not um, good to have too much of one type of species because it's not enough biodiversity. So a uh, point that I feel like we didn't discuss enough is the water temperature thing that you were talking about. Because what you were saying is that um, there's ways to adjust the environment to help put it back into black without necessarily having to remove the invasive species. And that's done in other areas by introducing predator or whatever it may be. But water temperature is something that we can't change, right? So we need to apply other solutions in the situation that maybe you wouldn't apply in another situation in regard to invasive species. So that's just something that stuck out at me that I wanted to highlight. Any other witness questions? So I think for a while, I just want to ask you, can you talk a little bit about the Institute and how you are reaching out to share the information how people could actually take advantage of the lab here, you know, get more involved in keep take, caretaking for their own soil, their own little land, their little box, whatever they grow vegetables in. Yeah, you know. so New York City Urban Institute, uh, it's uh, it's a platform for everything related to the soils. And we are an um, institute of, uh, in collab full of collaborators, not just in New York, but uh, outside of New York City boundaries uh, and even abroad. So if you have something that you would like to share, to expose or organize, or like we are the platform to, to talk about it. Uh, if you want to just to test your soils, we have a lab which is actually opening up this I don't know, like a week or two ago here on Governance Island, actually literally crossed like behind this wall. Uh, we have a second location at Floyd Benefield in Brooklyn. So if you go to our website, you can just Google New York City Urban In Soil Institute, you will see test your soil and then you'll send your sample and it will be analyzed or you can drop in both locations. So if you're here, um, uh, you will also see the price list of what you want to test for, and um, you can test for nutrients, uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, for organic matter, for pH, for salts, uh, and for heavy metals. You can get total concentrations. Bioaccessible concentrations are not easy to measure, even with this in vitro method. And right now, um, it's available in a couple of places, and I think it's like Ohio State University for sure, maybe Kansas as well. Uh, I do it only for research purposes, not for public. Um, yeah, so if you want to send it, it's um, it's very easy. And then you'll get results in a couple of weeks uh, by email, you'll get a report. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always contact us. Uh, the director of the Urban Cell Institute is another cross uh, the hallway at the Tana Morin. Uh, blunt woman, so you can talk to her uh, to know more. And we have the whole, uh, well, not the whole, at least part of the building is uh, collaborators of the institute. And uh, Donald and I have an uh, exhibition upstairs. Uh, so stop by and you can see um, more photos um, of our work and some uh, uh, lead um, sources and some amendments. Yeah, and you can talk to us if you have more questions. I would like Anya and Dalma, and of course all of you for coming here today, and of course the Institute, and Mary and Margaret, who, who have, there are two artists who have, uh, have a grant or lease of, on the building for three years, who invited all these, uh, you know, urban, social, soil, land projects to be here together. So they have a residency program too, where they invite artists to have studios. Um, as well. So please look around, enjoy, and thank you. Yes.